Japan was absolutely stunning to say the least and I wanted to document my very recent 12 days 11 night trip with my partner because it's a very very special trip for both of us. I will start off with a very brief overview of our itinerary and preference. This Japan trip spans across multiple cities starting from Tokyo where we landed at Haneda airport, 5 nights over there and another night at Hakone which is known for its hot spring and also proximity to Mount Fuji. And then we've also spent another 5 nights at Osaka as our base where we've also taken some time within the period to visit Kyoto before flying back to Malaysia from Osaka's Kansai airport. And yeah, I guess it's safe to say that it was a super super packed itinerary that covers a lot of the must do's for a first time traveler in Japan because YOLO why not right? And in terms of our expenditure we weren't trying to make it a budget trip per se because we actually saved up for a Taiwan trip back in March 2020. Yeah, but sadly pandemic hit and the trip was cancelled. So this trip was more like an upgraded version of that previously planned trip. Plus, I wanted to give her a surprise proposal alongside all her favorite Disney characters after knowing her for more than 16 years. But even with that said, we didn't really go all out especially on food and accommodation because we realized that most of the local shops offer much cheaper and also tastier food compared to the overcrowded and Instagram famous shops. I don't know if it's just us but the difference is quite apparent. Anyways, for our flight tickets, it costs us exactly 2,708 ringgit for a one-way trip from KLIA to Tokyo's Haneda airport. And that includes the cost for extra baggage allowance, express baggage, plus hot seats because this 8 hours flight is by far my longest flight ever and we did not regret it a single bit. And after that, it was a short 30 minutes ride on the airport express train to our first hotel in Ginza, Tokyo or also known as the district with the most upscale shopping spots. Some even call it the Times Square of Japan. And it also houses a 12-story Uniqlo Ginza which is the largest Uniqlo store in the world. We stayed at a chain hotel called Sotetsu Freza in Ginza. It was about 2,251 ringgit for 5 nights in total or about 450 ringgit a night and at this price you can call it a budget hotel because there's almost nothing to scream about this 140 square foot room. I mean just look for yourself other than small and compact there's literally no better word to describe it. I've measured the toilet it's two arms long and one arm wide. Yeah really really tiny. But that said, the location of the hotel pretty much made up for it. We were able to walk to the closest subway stations in less than 8 minutes and that gave us access to so many locations and attractions all across Tokyo and it was all made possible with this Suica card that we've loaded into our Apple Pay wallet. This card is amazing and it basically allowed us to pay for all subways and even for food in restaurants or even groceries in convenience stores all within the convenience of our mobile phone. But just one small thing to complain, all of my Visa, Debit and Credit Cards weren't able to reload this card but thankfully her Mastercard did the trick for us. If I were to describe their subway with a few words that would be cheap, efficient and punctual plus Google Maps can be paired with it so accurately and it's so much more affordable compared to the taxi fare over there. We have taken one, just one Uber ride to test out the infamous expensive taxi fares and boy were we not surprised. It cost me exactly 2,000 yen for a 12 minutes or 2.1 kilometers ride and on average that's like 1,000 yen or 30 ringgit per kilometer. Talk about expensive. This is a whole new level for me and actually both of us and that's why for the rest of our trip we've never set our foot on board any taxis again. So day 2 was basically devoted to Disneyland alone and we woke up super early in the morning because even though the official park opening hour was 9am, the internet actually encouraged us to arrive 1 hour earlier which we did. We arrived around 7.30am and man must I say, these people are super hardcore. The amount of people queuing this early is beyond words. 
I'm sure many of them started queuing around 5 to 6 a.m. So the money part, the base Disneyland tickets for two costed us around 514 ringgit. And the keyword here is base because this ticket just allows you to enter the park to do whatever you want. And that also unfortunately includes queuing for more than two hours for just one single ride or more than 30 minutes just to get the simpler snack etc. And yes, if you have been following my social media, then you would know that I proposed to the love of my life in front of Cinderella Castle. She did say yes and not gonna lie I was extremely nervous up until the point and even broke down in tears. It was for both of us touching and very beautiful to say the least and I'm glad I got all of this moment captured by a professional photographer that I commissioned from Airbnb experiences. Which of course does comes at the price tag of 40,000 yen or 1,250 ringgit for about 4 hours of work. Not the cheapest things but the results turned out to be amazing and I would gladly spend it again in a heartbeat. Anyways, we also spent an additional 160 ringgit for the Disney Premier Access aka the DPA Pass which is their version of Express Pass to go into the Beauty and the Beast Castle and boy that place is magical and definitely worth the money because the entire ride is more than 5 minutes long which is uncommon for theme parks and the sound design and decorations are really made up for it. Highly highly recommended for anyone visiting this place. As for the food in the park, let's just say it was mediocre and expensive but it was all to be expected because these foods were designed to appeal to the kids and parents would have other choices anyway right. And because we visited in the middle of November which is about one month away from winter, the temperature at night was freaking cold at around 4 degrees celsius plus with this strong blowing wind, we were under prepared especially on our facial area, we did not have any neck warmer or any ear mouse and boy did we suffer through the cold while we sat on the cold hard floor in the middle of the garden square watching the night parade which we also paid for 128 ringgit for two just to sit on the cold hard floor too cold for comfort but the parade was really really beautiful honestly plus it was christmas themed so everything was very christmasy so all in all it was a very enjoyable time despite the cold. Day 3 and 4 were basically planned in such a way that we would visit all the famous tourist spots in Tokyo while allowing us to rest our legs because a day in Disneyland alone clocked us more than 25,000 steps each of us. It was so so painful that the pain carried through the first half of this trip. So a little pro tip here, get this Epsom salt from the 7-Elevens or Family Mart for a salt bath because most hotels in Japan do come with a hot tub and man these were game changing, improved cold resistance plus around 20-30% to 30 relief in our legs. What a lifesaver. Anyways, we started off both days with their popular Japanese shrines and also temples. Meiji Jingu Shrine for the first day which gave a very calming zen vibes much like in the Maple Story game as well as Sensoji Temple at Asakusa which I'm sure at some point in time you have seen this big red lantern thing from Japan. And there's even a long stretch of shopping street called Nakamise Dori that sells a bunch of stuff ranging from souvenirs to local produce, street food toys and so many more and this is by far my favorite shrine in Japan. And speaking of shopping, that was also the beginning of my good luck charm shopping spree. Basically there are small pieces of charm providing different blessings like good fortune, good health, divine protection etc etc and they are really pretty inexpensive at around 500 to 800 yen each or about 15 to 30 ringgit each plus they serve as a very nice piece of souvenir so you know lah don't ask me why i bought so many of them and because Instagram, we also went to Shibuya to see the popular Shibuya Crossing because it's one of Japan's most iconic photographic spots. Yeah, watching people crossing the road. So cool right? What am I doing with my life? And in order to get the best view of the crossings, we actually paid 100 ringgit just to enter this private lounge at the top of the Magnet Shopping Mall. Definitely pricey to say the least but I did got the shot that I've always wanted to tick off the list so can't complain right? Oh we have also tried a popular Ichiran ramen store at their Shibuya branch, it's basically a ramen store just like any other but with a twist where you can order through their machine and sit in their anti-social booth and enjoy your ramen that costs around 50 ringgit each. It was very nice to say the least but would I queue 40 minutes again for this ramen? 
absolutely not. We can easily find something similar, if not better, at local restaurants without queuing and maybe also at half of its price. I guess the price tag does come for the food plus the experience included. And how can I forget Akihabara, the district famous for electronics and anime. It's literally a heaven for anime lovers. I mean, I personally don't really watch Japanese anime other than Gundam, Detective Conan and Doraemon. Don't judge, huh? But there's just something about Akihabara's vibe that is so young and so lively and colourful. And we literally stop every other shop because it is just so inviting to just look at all the things that it offered. From gachapon machines to secondhand electronic shop, Pokemon card shop, Gunpla store, and so many more. And yes, I did splurge around 27,000 yen, or about 830 ringgit, for this iconic metal built Gundam RX78 model, which is the same as the one standing at the Gundam Yokohama factory. Mm, don't judge me, huh? Personal Finance 101. And of course, Kelly and I, out of curiosity, we did try their famous maid cafe, and we both agreed without a single doubt, one of the most expensive and cringiest experiences ever in our life and we couldn't even understand what they were saying so that was definitely a huge miss. And speaking of miss, another miss that I couldn't believe that I would be saying right now is the Pokemon Center Mega Tokyo at Sunshine City, Ikekuburo. It saddens me so much because this was the place that I look forward to the most and it was so disappointing to find out that it's roughly the size of a typical Uniqlo store in Malaysia, like the one in Mid Valley, and the toys offered there weren't even anything special or exclusive. I probably should have done more online research myself, but this was easily a good waste of 3 to 4 hours considering Ikekuburo wasn't anywhere near our hotel in Ginza. Oh, by the way, if you're thinking about visiting Japan, you definitely need to know that most of their stores offer tax free shopping for foreigners with a foreign passport like us, which is easily a 10% discount on the final price. And to be frank, that was easily one of the most enjoyable things about Japan because I was able to get my hands on some stuff from Peak Design, Lululemon and Tommy Hilfiger at a price that is easily 20 to 30% lower than those offered in Malaysia. Even cheaper than the one from Mitsui Sepang. But that said, you also need to know that it comes at a caveat that the tax-free products bought cannot be consumed in Japan, like your liquor, clothes, drugs, electronics, souvenirs, etc. It must be consumed outside of Japan or else the immigration officer might penalize you if they choose to check your stuff. Not that they always do, so just keep that in mind. Day 5 in Japan was unplanned because we booked a super last minute day trip to Fuji. And when I said last minute, it was literally booked the night before the trip. But thankfully, Kluk is super efficient when it comes to stuff like this and we managed to hop on a 14-man van day trip to and fro Tokyo and Fuji. And that cost us about 500 ringgit for 2 person. And boy, it was absolutely freaking worth it to see Mount Fuji in flesh at the most perfect weather. Mm, mm, it's definitely a sight to behold. It is goddamn stunning. And with that day trip, we managed to cover a lot of those popular spots, including the Arakurayama Sengen Park that gives you the best Mount Fuji view alongside the Chureto Pagoda while overseeing the Fuji Yoshida town, plus the ever so peaceful and serene Oshino Hokkai village. And most importantly, my favorite of all, Lake Kawaguchiko with a stunning autumn foliage and unobstructed view of Mount Fuji. I would definitely come back to this town again because the view is just so stunning and it's definitely a photographer's heaven. Heck, a treat to the eyes for social media. Safe to say, pictures or videos cannot do this place justice. And speaking about revisiting, we actually left Tokyo on day 6 to a place that is also pretty close to the Fuji area. Hakone. This time we did it via Shinkansen, Japan's high speed bullet train with a top speed close to 300 km per hour. It's really an experience that one must not miss when visiting Japan. And of course, it is much, much pricier than the normal subway or metro trains. And FYI, Shinkansen comes in three different seat configurations. There's reserved seats in the green car, which is like the first class for airplanes. And then there's also reserved and non-reserved seats in the ordinary car for a more economy choice. And for this entire Japan trip, we actually tried all three types. But since this short trip from Tokyo to Odawara station only takes like 30 minutes, we actually saved up some and got the reserved seat in the ordinary car instead. So that's like 200 
170 ringgit for two person. Still pricey compared to driving yourself, but it's 30 minutes of train versus three hours of driving. So the time save for us is definitely worth it. And because our hotel is actually up the hill and nowhere close to the Odawara station, we had to travel up the hill via local trains. And that is when we also spent 378 ringgit for this Hakone free pass voucher, which basically allows us to travel freely for two full days in the Hakone region in trains, buses, cable cars and also a sightseeing trip on the pirate ship which unfortunately was cancelled due to poor weather condition. And if you have watched up until this point of the video, I just want you to know that I really, really appreciate that a lot. And here's a little secret for you. We actually splurged a little bit on our one night hotel stay in Hakone. Just a little, okay actually a lot lah, 2240 ringgit per night at this beautiful hotel called Hakone Kovakian Tenyo with a private onsen bath. I mean, the space of the room can definitely fit 4 people, but I believe this was the smallest room available at that time when I booked it. So I went ahead and booked it, plus I wanted to give Kelly a surprise and boy did we thoroughly enjoy the extra space, the private in-room onsen plus the absolutely stunning view of the Hakone Mountains. And we were actually surprised with this breakfast buffet because we thought it's just, you know, another typical hotel breakfast buffet. And we couldn't be more wrong because the buffet is literally serving everything ranging from bacon, chicken to full varieties of seafood. It even has crab legs. Like, hotel, breakfast, crab leg. I personally never really praised the buffet but this one, this definitely justifies the hefty price tag. 1010 would come back again even though it's like what, more than 2000 ringgit a night. Insane right but it's definitely worth it. So after our Hakone trip, it is time for the third and last part of this trip in Osaka and Kyoto. And this time we went all in and took the Shinkansen in the glorious green car from Odawara to Shin Osaka which also of course comes with a glorious price tag of 1290 ringgit for two person. Kinda nuts that we would pay this much for a two and a half hours train ride. But we thought that the best way to enjoy the highest form of train technology is to go all in with it since we are there already, right? And let's just say it was a very, very comfortable ride. But to be honest, the ordinary car should be more than enough for most if not all people. Unless you want more privacy since this is a 2x2 two two seating or you have kids or old people with you then maybe just maybe green car makes sense. Otherwise. It's just a splurge. There's no way for me to justify this cost other than label it experience. And when we have arrived at our hotel Sotetsu Fraser in Osaka Namba, it was already pretty late around 4.30 p.m. And yes, I said late because we were approaching winter. So the sun here actually sets around 5 p.m. And it rises just like the same in Malaysia at around 6 to 7 a.m. So the daytime we had over there were actually shorter by 2 to 3 hours. And if you recall the name of this hotel, yes, it's actually the same hotel chain from the one we stayed in Tokyo, Ginza. And similarly, we also spent another 5 nights over here as our base to travel to various parts of Osaka and Kyoto. And these 5 nights come at a higher price of 2840 ringgit or about 568 ringgit per night. And it comes with an almost identical layout as the earlier hotel. Super small and compact. But the best thing is, it is directly beside the Namba station's entrance. Literally 20 steps away from the entrance and it even had family mud right below it. Super, super convenient. And I said that because this was so, so helpful for our exhausted legs. Plus, we can travel to so many places with the subway metro. Plus, it's less than 10 10 minutes walk away from Dotonbori and Shinsaibashi, easily known for the signboard of the Glyco dude with his leg cup. Not that it's anything special, but the vibes there just screams youth. So much places to shop for clothes, drugs, I mean legal drugs, souvenirs and toys and it's also known for the variety of food that it offers more particularly local delicacy like takoyaki and also Osaka special okonomiyaki. It's basically just like takoyaki but on steroid in the shape of a pancake. Yeah, that's how I would describe it. It took us a long time to search for it because a lot of shops that serve okonomiyaki require reservation which we had none. But wow, luckily, right at the precise moment when we said 
screw it, let's just eat something simple and call it a day, we stumbled upon this shop called Taco Taco King. And we even had the opportunity to sit right in front of the chef and watch him cook. What can I say? Amazing food and amazing experience. 10 10 would recommend this spot. What is that? Yeah. yeah. Day 8 and 9 is pretty much dedicated to traveling in Kyoto, which is rich in culture, history, and amazing scenery that seems surreal to even be there in person. It's really that beautiful. We traveled to and fro for both days by Shinkansen from Shin Osaka to Kyoto. It's just a short 30 minutes drive and we got the non reserved seats in the ordinary class. So it was so much more affordable at 391 ringgit for 2 person in total or just below 100 ringgit one way for 2 person. We visited the Serene Arashiyama Bamboo Grove which is definitely a must visit for any first time visitor. And just right outside of it is the beautiful town of Arashiyama. What can I say? It's so unreal to see this in person minus the crowd of course and we also managed to visit the amazing Kinkakuji castle fully covered in gold leaves and when the midday sun shines into it it's a sight to behold and a treat for our cameras and social media of course this place does come with a small entrance fee of 15 ringgit or about 500 yen per person and of course how can we miss the instagram worthy fushimi inari shrine known for its more than 10,000 brightly colored orange tori gates it's definitely very very nice to see it in person but man must i say the amount of crowd there is just unbearable you would have to wait for a few minutes just to get a simple shot like this without a person behind you and going up the shrine it is packed like sardine so we ended up not finishing even 10 percent of the place it's basically torigate after torigate after torigate so it's not like we are missing anything important anyway i think Another spot in Kyoto that took our breath away while also making our leg pain so unbearable is Kiyomizu Dera, one of the oldest Buddhist temples founded in the 780s and is also a part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site. The view at the hilltop where the temple is nothing less than stunning, really really breathtaking and I even managed to get that famous landmark shot and that makes the more than 2 kilometers uphill walk totally worth it. Not that I would do it again but it's definitely worth a visit for first timers because when you come downhill there's actually a very beautiful town filled with tons of street food restaurants gift shops etc and whatnot and we even got to try the local matcha latte prepared in the most authentic way right in front of us but there's actually a small little regret or should i say unfortunate turn of events because i was actually hoping to get this famous shot of the beautiful yasaka pagoda amidst the nostalgic looking valley but very sadly it's time started to rain and I was running with my bag and camera ready to take the shot just to find out that there's actually construction going on in one of the buildings right in the middle of the shot so no luck on that one what the fuck man this thing blocks the view but never mind because day 10 is the day for Universal Studios Japan and we have been looking forward to it and just like Disneyland, it's entry ticket or they call it the studio pass each come at around 300 ringgit per person on cloak without any express pass whatsoever because I wasn't able to buy any of the express pass for the 21st of November. For some reason, that particular date is sold out but not the day before or after it. And boy were we not disappointed when they tell you that all you need to do was run right after you enter the USJ theme park in order to enter the Super Nintendo World. Because if you come anytime after 10am or so, you will need to have a special pass called the Time Area Entry Ticket which only comes with the Express Pass that can easily cost an additional 400 to 800 ringgit per person on top of the base studio pass. The place was magical to say the least and everything looked so real. It's like you are actually in the game itself and to get the most of the experience there, we even bought the overpriced watch band that cost around 130 ringgit each. Was it worth it? 50-50 for me, it's a pretty useless accessory if you ask me unless you want to participate in getting those virtual Super Mario coins or treat it like a souvenir for you to take home but really nothing more than that. And we also managed to squeeze into the wizarding world of Harry Potter and thanks to the almost perfect weather, I managed to get a shot of the Hogwarts castle in all its glory without any cloud. 
but unfortunately we did not queue for the rides because everything there is easily a two hour queue without an express pass. And just to share this very funny incident, we initially did not want to queue for the popular butter beer because the line is just too damn long. And somehow we got lucky when we stood beside a closed butter beer store and suddenly the USJ staff just came and opened up the store. And guess what? We became the first in line to buy the butter beer right in front of the Hogwarts castle. Mm. It's an AMW uh, minus the sparkling water plus some caramel and a little bit of butter taste. Mm. And of course, I bought the one with the plastic mark to take home as a souvenir. And in my opinion, the food in USJ is slightly better than that in Disneyland. Just buy a bit because it's still very overpriced. But for some reason, we got this pork and chicken platter from the dinosaur restaurant for around 90 ringgit each, which was very, very filling actually. So I guess that's a pass for its price tag. But overall, it was an amazing USJ experience for both of us. And I would definitely recommend it to anyone visiting Osaka because everything there just seems so lively and the different parts and team in the park just makes it so satisfying to just stroll around even doing nothing and just enjoy the view but of course be prepared to fork out around 1000 ringgit for the base studio pass plus express pass for each person if you want to enjoy more of the rides and what can i say for day 11 it's almost the end of the trip and we purposely did not plan anything at all except waking up super late at around 10 a.m it is even crazy to even say this because on average we woke up around 5 a.m every day our initial plan was to just visit shinsekai and do some last minute shopping around dotombori but when we came down at this station that was 300 meters away from tenoji zoo it was an instant click by kelly because she loves animals so much and so Unplanned and YOLO we went, surprisingly it was one of the best memories that we've had in Japan because the animals there were so unique. I mean we saw wolves, giraffes, polar bears, owls and we even managed to see this cute red panda munching away right in front of us. We had a really good time over there. So day 12 is when we would leave Japan and so we got this airport express train ride from Namba station to Osaka's Kansai airport. It was a 45 minutes ride and costed us about 90 ringgit for 2 person in the more luxurious train with its super wide seats. Pricey, yes, but definitely the most comfortable way for us to say goodbye to the amazing times that we have in Japan. The flight back to Kilae on Air Asia was about 3,359 ringgit with the hot seats for the two of us, slightly pricier than our incoming trip for some reason even though it's about one hour shorter so all in all based on my generous calculations on the amount of money i've spent for the trip it was close to 19,000 ringgit before any food and shopping because everyone's got their own preference right and if i add that up with the food shopping and some other miscellaneous this 12 days 11 night trip easily cost me north of 30,000 ringgit some might say that it's a small amount for two person while some might say it's way too much money spent to each their own right but for us we just wanted to have a good experience plus it's a proposal trip plus i get all the shots that i want that beautiful mount fuji view with the autumn foliage the bustling streets of shibuya crossing the amazing kiyomizu dera overlooking kyoto the stunning golden king kakuji temple the graceful cinderella castle right in the middle of tokyo disneyland and the magical hogwarts castle in usj say no more i'm gonna buy my tickets to japan again hopefully you enjoyed this rather casual video a little bit of finance here and there plus a little bit of travel stuff and hopefully this inspires you to work harder and save up for a visit to Japan or any other similar countries because it is indeed a very very beautiful country minus the crowd it would be an easy recommendation from me thanks for watching let me know in the comments down below which part you like the most or what we have missed out during our trip until then I'll see you in the next one